Mountain in the community, public safety is always um, number one on their list of concerns. Um, there were several smaller changes. Everybody had an opportunity to speak up and offer an amendment or to offer a change. There were some that were offered that were voted down and some that were offered and um, were forwarded by this council because everybody voted for it. Um, there's about $237,000 in, in changes. Uh, anywhere from adding a couple of part-time people in district court, which I think was Councilwoman Galloway's, to um, adding staff in the city clerk's office for elections, um, uh, adding a staff person in our office. Uh, it was voted on to um, give raises or uh, to restore money to the Flint City Council's pay. And then there was also a, a move to um, make a contribution towards uh, Brennan Center and Hasselburn. And I think that, if I'm missing anything, I think that about sums up all of the changes that were recommended that night um, by council and that were voted on. Of those changes, uh, the, the emergency manager said that they were not going to, or he is not going to make a final determination on that $1.8 million until they finish the study um, on, on the uh, police department and the fire department by the folks from Wayne State. So while he didn't approve it, he didn't disapprove it yet either. Um, district court, he did change, turn that down. He did add a staff person in our office and a um, position in the city clerk's elections. He did turn down uh, the request for additional pay for city council, but he did keep in um, the request for Brennan and Hasselbrink. Thanks. So those are there as well. And I think that there was some additional changes in DCED that the mayor proposed, which would actually increase um, a, a staff, one staff position mayor or two? I can't remember. One staff plus an additional allocation uh, for economic development in DCED that was not there. Thank so, you. Thank you, Councilman. Kind of a mixed bag, I guess. Thank you. Mr. Mays, Councilman Mays. All right, thank you, Mr. President. This communication will be to the public, the media, and my colleagues. Um, there were a series of meetings, as uh, the understanding that I had was that the emergency manager was going to get out of the way, allow the council and the mayor to go through an exercise of amending and changing his proposed budget. And as long as we kept a balanced budget, he would seriously consider that. Since the council and the mayor have proposed changes, and since we have got back communications internally, we know that the emergency manager did approve some of those changes. I'm here to tell my colleagues, I sent Mr. Freeman, the finance chair, a email last week. I said, how can we represent people and haven't had the public hearing and we need to hear from the public as to what we want, not what they want, and then and only then do we make these changes and proposals. I'm appalled that the chairperson sent me back a communication and said we've met enough and there will be no more meetings. In essence, that's what's been said and I'm just hearing from the public today. I heard what I suspected. I heard that the public want lower water rates. I see an opportunity for this council to meet and lower water rates. I don't have another job. I worked for General Motors for 30 something years. And if I choose to be a council person, whether I do it for 216 every two weeks, whether I do it for a dollar or whether I do it for 20,000. It don't matter to me, but I'm a council person, and my job is to be the check and balance on the administration, and one of my primary functions is to do a budget once a year. See, in a regular government, the mayor proposes the budget, and the council can amend it and change it and send it back. And if the mayor veto that, six council votes overrides and set the budget. We're doing a budget for the first time in the history of the city of Flint, a two-year budget. I sit in on those hearings, and my colleague can say I'm wrong, but I'm telling you we concentrated on one year, 2015. We didn't scrutinize 2016. 
This budget won't be for formal adoption until June the 30th or so. And I'm telling you today is the ninth. We need to get in a room, close the door for four, five, six hours. But remember, our meetings can't be closed. They're open to the public. And I'm appalled when people tell me they won't meet and discuss a budget which includes lower water rates, more than 50,000 to create jobs. We should have a million or more to create jobs. <laughs> jobs is number one. I put jobs over jails. I put jobs over police. The police department, they talking patrol. Guess where we hurting at? The detective bureau. It's complaints laying there, name and suspect. Killers need to be picked up off the street through the detective bureau. We need undercover police. Crooks run when you see patrol officers. I will put undercover police on the street in the detective bureau to clean up the first ward if they don't want to clean up the other wards. We know who the people are. The detective bureau, don't let them let you focus on state police patrol. It's more to a police department than patrol officers. You got detective and undercover. That's where we show that in Flint. I'm going to also say this. I'm going to also put a motion on the floor, and if it die for a lack of a second with no discussion while I got the floor under this so-called five-minute rule, that five-minute rule, Scott, goes to the end, public comment. I've read the order, I've got the order, and so my motion is this while I got the floor. I move that this council meet at least four more times for at least three hours apiece in order to do the budget based on what we've heard in this public hearing and we look at changing money around. It was wrong to do that budget before we had the public hearing, so I so move. Councilman Mays, I'm going to um, allow you to make your motion again later on. Right now, my motion is made. When I get the floor under Robert's rules, I put a motion on the floor. If my motion died for a lack of second, that's what you do when you get the floor. You can make motions, and that's Robert's rules. If somebody second it, that's fine. If they don't, I sleep well tonight. You don't have to allow me. That motion is so made, and that's the order of the business. Nobody on this council have to support it. My my job is done. I sleep well. I second well. the motion, Scott. I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Eric, and you know that I'm allowing council members to respond because you wanted the opportunity to respond to the public that spoke on the budget and on the streetlight assessment. If, if I followed the rules of the emergency manager, we wouldn't even be speaking until the very end of the meeting, and that would be the place for you to make that motion. So I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to tell you that as the chair, I'm not going to allow you to, write, to make a motion at this time. Mr. You can President, wait. I appeal the decision of the chair under not, Robert's rules. Not of order, that Eric. motion no. was in order. I made it when I had the floor. Mr. Davis' second was in order. And if you sit and tell me that you ain't going to allow a motion that's been properly made under Robert rules, I appeal the decision of the chair. Just because you don't want a motion to come when somebody got the floor, let me say this. That emergency manager order says, when you recognize as one of us, we Eric, got the floor. Eric, and so that's, want me to read the order I brought it. It says Eric, the council five, president can your, recognize somebody. Your five minutes are up. No, five my five minutes, minutes up. wasn't up before the motion was properly made. Five, and Mr. Eric, Davis supported the motion. We in discussion. No, we're not. Your five minutes are up. You worse than the emergency manager, ain't you? You think you a dictator? I'm not a dictator. Well, then the motion has been made and properly second. Now we should be in discussion of the motion. No, because I'm not going okay, to Okay, well, that's motion. on my colleagues. I Thank appeal you. your decision, and if they don't want to make you act right, that's on them. I won't be a part of wrongdoing. My motion is made and properly second. He I'm seconded. Not, if I'm you don't want to go to discussion, then what we learn, I can appeal the decision. You out of order, and everybody know it. You out of order. 
I appeal your decision. Now, what did we learn? We vote you're, on that Jerry, appeal. You're out of order. You out of order. Councilwoman Poplar. Let it ride, Pastor. Thank you. Ain't that great? I just want to comment on a couple of things. Um, first of all, we had a person come up here and talk about um, the fees, that we can turn these fees back. Well, we just don't have the power to touch a fee, whether there's an emergency manager or not. We can't hire the police. We can't fire the police. We can't tell the police what to do. We can't tell a city worker what to do. And these rules are in our charter. If we could lower the fees, God in heaven knows I would be the first one. Because I feel your pain. I'm paying the same identical prices that you are. I'm looking at the same grass that you're looking at. The only thing I ask for the constituents and the people of the city of Flint, those that do live in a house, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, respect the person that lives next door to you. If that person is cutting their grass, cut your grass. That would help our city. That's where one of our biggest problems, I myself have lived in my home for 40 years, and all of a sudden, I have a homeowner from the west side of hell. You won't cut your grass. That's part of our problem. We don't help ourselves. My next thing, the Flint River water. Some of you I have known for a number of years, and I'm looking at you right now. We all grew up St. John Street. We all grew up in Flint. 40 years and over, sitting right here, some of you I do know, and you know me, we've been knowing each other. We grew up on Flint River water. We grew up, and we're still here. I don't agree with the statistics of the water. I think it needs more testing. But if you can buy your water, then buy it. Boil it, do whatever you got to do with it. But we have grew up on Flint River water. And some of us are still here. Now it may have affected me, some days I do act crazy, and that's understandable. Now, street lights. If you go down Clio Road, every street light is on. If not, it went out last night. Call your council person. Ask them to get your light turned on for you. Everyone that has called me in the second ward with a light out, the light is in. The poles have been fixed. So they need to make the call if you can't seem to get through. In the event that there's a light out and there's no house number there, on the telephone pole or the light pole is a metal number. Give that number when you get ready to make your call to get the light in. So I'm talking right now, second ward, you got a light problem, then just call me. And I'll call Diana, who is Mr. King's secretary. And we got lights put in over on Forest Hill and anywhere else there's a light. When I ride at night and I'm out at night, I write down. So if you, there is no house number, look on the pole, there is a metal tab with a number on it and make that call. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight and voicing your opinion. But I feel your pain, because I'm paying your same bills that you guys are paying. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Nolan. Um, thank you, um, thank you, um, Chair. You know, um, it's been about a year or so ago that I started speaking about um, what I see happening here in the city of Flint. 
And gentrification has been taking place for some time now. And, you know, gentrification is where we see um, areas being ran down and middle class starting to come back in and they're starting to redevelop. If we look at downtown, we see the loft apartments and we have a lot of folks moving back in downtown. But in the areas where the greatest needs are, we're not seeing the investment. And this has been taking place for some time. And I spoke to this when I made that initial vote when I voted no for the KWA. And it was because the information that we were receiving from the emergency manager at that time, he wasn't giving it to us. Uh, and then when he decided to give us information, give it to us at the last minute, he wants us to make um, a decision on the spot. You know, I'm the kind of person I like to research and read things for myself and then make an informed decision um, based on that. But, um, you know, I, I, anybody that would listen, I talk about gentrification because it's been taking place in this community for some time. They, they, uh, people want control of the city of Flint because this city um, still has the infrastructure and everything in place. And, you know, you can't get the infrastructure that you have in the Owl County that you have here in the city of Flint. And that's why we're seeing the devaluation of a lot of the properties and a lot of the areas in the city of Flint. Because what they're doing, um, they're bundling certain areas where you can't even buy property. And they're doing that because they're setting it up so that um, the developers in the very near future will be able to come in and buy these properties. And once they buy these properties and they redevelop them, the folks that grew up in those areas can't even afford to live. All you got to do is take a prime example what they've done in Harlem, in New York, what they've done in Chicago, what they're doing right down in Detroit around the Fox Theater area. You know, so gentrification is, is, is alive and well here in this community, and we have to be very careful with it. You know, um, we have to really do our research, and we have to look at what, what, they're, what they're actually doing. Now, that's, that's just the one point that I want to speak on as it relates to the streetlight assessment. One thing that, that really gets me with the streetlight assessment, and, and, you know, I sit on that land bank board, and I give them a lot of flack over there. And, and I do appreciate what, what AC did a couple of weeks ago when he did that town hall meeting because that got some information out in the community where a lot of folks did not know what was actually going on. But related to the streetlight assessment, um, if you have a vacant lot, that you've bought next to your house, they charge you a streetlight assessment on that vacant lot. So what we're seeing now is a lot of the vacant lots that people have bought and maintaining and doing different things on, they're letting those lots go back because they refuse to pay that 70 or whatever odd dollars there is for a streetlight assessment on a vacant lot. They also do the same thing with the garbage fees. They charge on those vacant lots they charge a garbage assessment as well. This is all byproduct of what I talk about, about gentrification, because they're trying to run folks out of certain areas because they want to come back in and buy it, and they want to redevelop it. And when they redevelop it, we won't be able to afford it. So we got to really, we got to really think about, we got to really think about what's going on here, and we have to look at it for what it's worth, and we have to be real cognitive, and um, um, make some some real tough decisions as we as we move forward because this this is happening i mean you know prime example is if we look at the american spiral well they were talking about that um, company coming in and is going to build the pipes for the pipeline um they still haven't broke ground on that we're supposed to have a plan up by august but we just got 2.3 million dollars from the state of michigan to redevelop or restructure andrew street just about a half a mile long, that's in the third th ward. And then right when you get off the highway, right under the underpass, they're, re they're redoing that. And they're doing that because they know they're going to have all on Stewart. And they're doing all this because they're going to have an overabundance of these heavy, heavy um, semi-trucks coming in and transporting stuff out. So they got a master plan for certain areas. So you have to be real cognitive of what's going on, and you have to do your research on it. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman Davis. <clears throat> Yes, um, thank you, Mr. President. You know, at times it get real stressful up here for me because this is something new to me. I have to be honest with the audience. It's something new to me. I wasn't in here when the financial manager came and whatever else was going on that warrant his presence here. But what I want people to realize is that there's a great form of distraction going on. 
And the distraction that is going on is they making you believe because council acts for certain things that it pays a uh, dampers on public safety. We have a $5.3 million millage that was passed in 2012. In 2013, that millage came up to be $5 million or so. 2014, $5 million. If you hired and gave each and one of those 55 public safety employees $50,000 a piece, it would only be $2.5 million. In benefits, it can be another $2.5 million for $50,000 at the highest. Firefighters don't make $50,000. Some of them make $10 to $12 an hour, which is probably $20,000 a year. So I just put $50,000 with it just to show you that that millage can finance those police officers and those firefighters. See, the argument can't be on what council is talking about or asking. The argument needs to be is where's the money? Make people become accountable of the money. See, we can argue all day. You know, it's called mass manipulation. We can argue all day, but while we argue, the thief is going out the back door. And when we finally realize that we've been arguing and bickering over small things, it's too late. It's gone. That's the reason why I felt compelled to write the United States Attorney General to let him know that we need the feds to come in here and investigate and do a forensic audit. It's a difference between doing that and what the courts is ruling on. Now, the courts is going to rule on to say if it's unconstitutional or not, but that doesn't make a difference right now. What makes a difference is when we stand together as a whole. See, Detroit is in the worst deficit as ever. But Detroit Council still gets what they get because their residents stand behind their councilmen, no matter how bad it gets. No matter how bad it gets. But we're focusing on the wrong thing. And that's what bothers me and it behooves me to speak about these things. And when I wrote this letter to the United States Attorney General Office, I did it in my heart. I put my soul into it because I seen that the masses is being manipulated. We arguing over the wrong thing. Now, if council was making $200 every two weeks and he doesn't have a job, his job is working for you. Who wants a disqualified servant? Everybody wants a quality worker. Now, I'm going to give you a prime example when I mention this, because my duty is for the people. Trust me, it's for the people. And the people is always foremost. Where I came from for 19 years, and God blessed me with this position, it is a beacon of God, it's a beacon of light through the mercy and just of God to put me in this position. I know it's by God's grace. That's right, sister. I know what injustice is. So in order for God to put me in this position, it was for a reason. It was for a purpose. And I would be a fool to go against that. It's not about self, but at the end of the day, it's about truth and principle and justice. It's about justice. Please bear with me when I tell you this. I wouldn't give a care if it was for a dollar. I wouldn't care. But I'm telling you, if I had $20 in my pocket and I cannot drive to your house if a tree fall in your yard because I got a half a tank of gas, I got to make a decision. Now I got a constituent who's saying he don't never come to my house. But I can't. I can't afford it. But let me tell you this. Let me tell this for my critics. Let me explain this to my critics. When you in prison, let me explain this to my critics. When you in prison and you come home from prison, there's a systematic design for a person with a number on his back to not get employed. It's a system in, in place for that. You got 30,000 felons in this city that doesn't have a job. You got 30,000 people with felonies on their record that don't have a job in a city that only have 95,000 people. And you wonder why the crime rate is up. These people go to prison, they get a number on their back, or they give them a number in the county jail. So when they get out the county jail, they have no leverage. There's no support system in place for them. Councilman so Davis, your five minutes are up. Thank you. But let me Thank say you. this real quick, Mr. President, then I'm going to conclude it. Order out in the audience, please. But this, I'm going to conclude it. I'm going to conclude it. <clears throat> everything I do, everything I do, I don't meditate on it, I don't contemplate it. I do it based on meditation. I mean, I do it based on revelation. When God reveals something to me, I fall on it and I study it. And I seek and find its purpose. 
It was an impossibility in a million people's mind that I would make it in the position that I'm in. And there's a million other people who suffered dearly like I did, saying that's hope. I never thought I could be nothing, but I seen Mr. Davis today, I know I can be something. That one person may be that one person who was deciding to go behind somebody's house and mug an old lady, and now he's decided to say, I won't do that because there's hope. Thank you, Councilman Davis. <clears throat> Councilman Neely. Thank you, Mr. President. I do want to thank all of you for uh, staying around to uh, hear us talk and enduring this very, very cold climate in this room right now. It is very, very cold. And I want to share with you, I do share your frustration as it relates to all the things that's happening in our community right now. We all share your frustration and we understand the emotions that's attached to that frustration and the misdirected hostility because we can't take everything personal. I don't as a council person because this is the only time that you as a resident of the city of Flint have any opportunity to address the wrongs that's happening on the side of our community. And when I look at this budget and the budget proposal, uh, through my tenure here, along with uh, Councilman Freeman, Nolden, uh, Poplar, and Kincaid that we've been here before, we went through this budget process prior to the emergency manager coming. And what's happening now is, is abnormal as it relates to a budget process. Because when Councilman Mays actually he stated the fact that the mayor and administration usually presents a budget to the city council as a co-equal branch of government and the municipality, we are your check and balance. And then we override the administration if we feel the budget is not in order to facilitate the needs of the residents inside the city of Flint. Since I've been here, uh, we have overrode many mayors, Don Williamson, Dane Walling. I'm, I'm not for sure if Dane Wallen has ever presented a budget to this council that we have not overrode. I don't think he's presented a budget that we accepted. But we've had the ability to do that, to right-size it. But once that process is done, once the city council goes forward to right-size the budget for the revenues that's coming in, for the expenditures that's going out, it's left up to the administration to follow that budget. We've had that problem where we overspent. Now, we don't operate the day-to-day -day operations inside the city of Flint. Waste collection, public safety, uh, blight enforcement. The administration, that's in their lane. And when they overspent, that triggered a reaction by the state. And that reaction was to force, and we all know force is violent, to send in an emergency manager. And that goes to Councilman Nolden's point when he talks about gentrification. And it's, it's more, we can't call it racism, it's more like classism because poor individuals in this community are being shaken out of this community. We are rated in the nation as one of the most violent communities, as one of the communities that's shrinking in size. They don't want really anything, when I talk about they, we talk about those that's engaging in this process to annex everything north of Welch Street. They call it green space, but we know green space is unmaintained space. And it's reflected in this budget. When we talk about the reduction of 36 police officers, maybe 19 firefighters, they put out those high numbers. So when they only cut 20 police officers and maybe 10 firefighters, we think that we had a victory. They add more state troopers to our community. And that's nothing more than de facto martial law. We don't operate those police officers. So when I look at the streetlight assessments, the garbage collection assessments, the increase in, in, in taxation, we all really have to really recognize what this is. And we, as a council, don't have that much authority to override what the emergency manager is. And I want to make sure that it's, that it's really plain for the residents to understand what it is. And I'm going to ask Councilman Freeman to assist me with this process because we've done our very best because the emergency manager, the third one that we've had, is Darnell Early, and we had committee meetings. And during that process, the chairperson then asked Mr. Early, if we make the modifications to this budget, will you then honor them? He stopped the meeting and said that, and I was very impressed with that, Josh. And he said, yes, he would. We did not change the bottom line of this budget, but we made recommendations to where we saw that the need was greatest inside the city of Flint. And Mr. Freeman, can you help me with this and just tell me of the modifications and recommendations that we made? Go ahead, you can, finish. Can, can you tell me which ones did the emergency manager honor? I know you said to the Brennan Center, and also Haskell Brink, but we put $20,000 in those centers in total, but is the $11,000 uh, 
274, the only monies that he honored in that and not the additional, uh, the other 20,000 for those? I'm going to let Councilman Freeman respond to your okay. question, Councilman Neely. Uh, 20,000 each to the centers. Okay. For a total of 40. Okay, great. That, that's, that's because we definitely need those centers. Um, what about the modifications to, uh, I call it the sharing and sacrifice, because what we did was reduce salaries for some of the individuals who works in administration that's making these uh, absorbent amount of salary, six-figure salaries, during this time in, in our community where we have great need. Did he honor that or did he uh, restore that? Restore that back to those individuals. Yeah, I, I think what we did is we took 65000 out of finance, which I think the intention of the council was to take that away from the finance director. He did not honor that. Um, and we also took um, I, that 20 some odd thousand out of the Human Relations Commission, which um, I think the intent there was to take that from the Human Relations Director. Um, he did take that money back from. Uh, the Human Relations Commission and did use some of that money towards the senior centers. Uh, he did not cut her pay, but he did change that function where she, I don't believe she's over that function anymore. That's going to be in the mayor's office or the city administrator's office, however that rolls out. But that board will still continue as a volunteer board. Okay. So well, no, he did not change. He didn't uh, do anything different to um, the changes that were requested by council for our salaries. He did not do anything different for the finance director or the HR director. I think that was the Those three. Those were the three. Right. Those were the three. And, and I talk about the sharing and sacrifice because we are all, some of us are suffering in silence, not you that came out to speak out, but many of the residents inside the city are suffering in silence and we have to champion um, their right to have a good quality of service inside the city of Flint. Now, if the emergency manager is not sharing in the sacrifice and those administrative people that not, are making six-figure salaries are not sharing in the sacrifice uh, and they're continuing to increase services and cost to, to well, cost of services inside the city of Flint, uh, I, I probably won't be supporting this budget uh, as, it, as it comes before us. But there definitely needs to be a forensic audit on our water and sewer fund. We engaged in that process when we had power as a council. It then was uh, immediately stopped. Uh, when the emergency manager Mike Brown came in. We also had, just one more point, yeah. and I'm, I'll and move on, but, but <clears throat> these street light assessments that continuously goes up every year, we had an opportunity with a $1.2 million grant from the federal government, an energy grant, that when we talked about this, and Councilman Freeman was one of the champions on this particular project, where we could have mo took that $1.2 million grant, modified our street light assessments to LED lighting, uh, giving you a much more cost efficient lighting where there we would not have to pay for this antiquated uh, old style of lighting in our community but that was forfeited because it was it was mismanaged by the administration at that time so when we talk about frustration we're frustrated as a council but please let's place our frustration in the correct form and give it to the correct uh, departments that deserve it thank you all thank you councilman Neely. <clears throat> Councilperson Galloway. Thank you, Council President. Um, first of all, I'd like to share with the community, um, Councilman Mays made a motion to meet four more times before the budget is adopted. Um, I would not support that because I personally sat down with the emergency manager and asked him questions about this process. His exact words to me, and Peter Bay was in the meeting, was this exercise was never designed to go this way. Anybody that understands verbiage, exercise means that you were just working on something. We already had in mind what we were going to do. And the reason why he made that is because I explained to him that there were questions that were being asked of the mayor and the department heads that had come in that in my opinion were very intricate when you are making cuts or where you're adding to people and the fact that the mayor made it clear that that wasn't necessary for those department heads to answer kind of raised red flags to me and the reason why I share with him this is a new council asking questions this is council um, president over the finance Josh Freeman and because he is a tenured council in my opinion, he knows the questions that need to be asked 
in order to do an effective budget. And so when the questions he's asking are not being answered, for me as a new council person, that raises red flags. And so when I addressed that to him, he said, this exercise was never designed to go the way you all are doing it. We only wanted the council to look at the budget to see if you saw anything we had not seen. Those are Mr. Early's direct words to me. And so I said to him, if that is the case, why are we spending so much time on this budget? If I'm not going to learn anything during this process, what should I be focusing on? He said, Councilperson Galloway, you should be focused on the seven point strategic plan. So for the community, we were not actively going to make any changes to the budget. I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I was told. And so this is the reason why I will not engage in four more meetings on something that, in my opinion, is meaningless. So I just wanted to share that. The second thing, I spoke with Mr. Early also on the police issue because there is a um, study that's going to be done. I was told by Mr. Early that that study was being done by ICMA. Um, I don't know if that's different. But um, I, I became emotional. And the reason why I was telling him, as the worst place in the world to live because of violence, how are we supposed to survive when we can't even keep up with crime with the current level of police officers that we have on the force? How can we cut 20% and expect that it's going to be better? And he said that um, we are not going to make, and I guess because I became emotional, but see, understand, it sounds good to say my water bill is $115 and I'm going to move, but I'm, I, I have a, I, I have a um, real estate license. That sounds good, people, but many of us don't have the opportunity because our water bill is too high to move to another community. And so this is where we live. This is where we raise our children. Everybody doesn't have that opportunity. So we have to figure it out. And I said that to say this. When he said that to me, I said, I don't mean to get emotional, but this is where I raise my children. I live in a community where my grandchild is going to come. I need it to be safe for him. So they're supposed to do this study that's going to tell you real facts. How many police officers you really need on the force? So those are things that we don't have anything to say about. With the water bill, there was a loud cry that went out before KWA was approved. And as a community, we didn't speak out when we needed to speak out. And so now, what we can hope is that we do have a forensic audit, hopefully. But as a community, we need to step up. My last point, my concern is that the residents, that we would help each other in any way that we can. Some have more, some have less. But know that this community is not as poverty driven as they want us to believe. And the way that you know that, people, is you cannot have some of the best education in the world in your midst and think that they are going to let it continue to spiral down. This is an opportunity, like Councilman Nolden said, to weed out who can. So I don't care what you have to hold on to. You make sure that you do what you can, because they are coming in. Michigan State is not going to invest $9 million into a city that is going to continue to spiral down in crime. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I'm no economist, but I'm telling you that this city has great potential. And if we can just hold on and ride this thing out, we will be okay. But we have to support each other. And fighting against one another is not the answer, you guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilperson Galloway. Councilperson Van Buren. Yes. I want to acknowledge those that came out today. It was fantastic to see so many of you. I know some have left, but to see the numbers I was talking to Councilman Mays earlier before the meeting. I said, do you think they're going to turn out? You think somebody's going to say something about what needs to be done in this city? I applaud you to see you. Some of you are new. Some of you are regulars. But you need to be there. We cannot do this by ourselves. 
True. Counsel is like A.C. Duma says, is this for naught? I truly believe that almost every day that I go home after being at one of these meetings. But because you are there, I don't want to continue to believe that because you need to keep us going in the direction to take care of the needs of this community. When you talk about water bills, blight, the lack of police, keep it going. Keep sharing that. Keep pushing it. Because if we lay back and do nothing, then we might as well just close the door on this city. Do not, do not give up. I need you. We need you. I believe also with the budget process, we worked some long hours trying to understand. Some of you came out. It was open to the public. But I truly, deeply believe monies are there. Monies have to be put in the right place to do what it is needed. Because believe me, if something needs to be done and they want it done, money shows up. But when we need something done, mm, I don't know where that money's coming from. So I think if you stay with us, keep it going, keep showing up at these meetings, talk to the council that are your representatives. You know, I know there's many that talk to some of them, but I also want to hear from my people. And my people are talking to me, and it's sad because there are so many without water that are surviving, carrying gallons of water into their home so they can take care of themselves because they cannot afford to keep their water going. How many more households, and I know they're out there, but can we force them to put on their water? I mean, if you talk a couple hundred dollars, $400 for a bill, that is a lot. And a lot of us are not at that type of income. When you, right now it's summertime, we're, we're adjusting. It's a good thing it's not winter. To bring that point home, my mother is a senior citizen, going to be 89 years old. Has a two-story home, but she only lives on the first level because she can't hardly walk, she can't hear, and we keep checking on her every day. She got a water bill for almost $300, and normally she gets it for 90 and we've been tolerating the 90 But that much? It's like, what in the heck? And, and people are saying, well, maybe that's the raise. That is not the raise, you know, that we're getting. Something is going on. And we need to get together and find out what it is, what to do, what prevention can we take, how to make ourselves smarter in dealing with these situations that we have. Because we have got to find the answer. We've got to fight back instead of letting it take over on us. And I don't know what the answers are, but let's do it together. And like uh, Councilwoman Poplar says, you know, of helping each other out, looking out for each other. I know that goes on, and sometimes it's hard to do because you can barely do things for your, yourself, but even sharing information with someone, talking to someone, checking to see if they're okay, uh, keeping informed. Our newspaper is not as available to us as it used to be. Our internet, not everybody has that. But I want to give kudos for Mike Kilbreth and his talk show. If you have not listened to it, you need to, to stay informed. Pastor Trekwell has his show. And I know he, he loves this city. And he gets upset when he gets up here. And he has a right to. But deep down, he would love to see all good things happen in this city. And I have not forgotten Mr. A.C. Dumas. Right away on Saturday morning, that's the station I put on when I get up and listen through the afternoon because everybody has something to say, including Sheldon Neely, Neely's program. So I didn't forget. But that's called staying in touch. If you have not heard their shows, then you are missing out on what is happening in this city because you're not going to always see it in the newspaper. You need to hear it from these people because they are out at the meetings. 
So support them. And Mrs. Mohammed, when you said uh, we need to be the voice of the people, keep us in line with that. Keep us going. Let us know what we need to do to make that better. And I want to end with a comment that the pastor say, said, better days are coming. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just want to take a second and just thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, this is an unusual budget process for the city council. It's unusual for the years that I've been on the city council um, to go through. And in, your, your voice is important. I mean, we don't have the power and the authority. We've made some suggestions in changes. We we're deeply concerned about the police department and the cuts in the police department. And by us being able to redirect or make recommendations to redirect $1.8 million for public safety, um, and the emergency manager agree with that, um, you know, I, th I think that was a, a very good step in the right direction. It wasn't all that we need, but it was what we could come up with within the, the parameters that we had. So, again, I just want to thank everyone for not just coming out speaking, but for staying for the rest of the meeting and listening to us. So, thank you very much. Madam Clerk, are there any other petitions or unofficial communications? Are there any other communications from city officials at this time, Madam Clerk? No. Uh, council committee reports, uh, because of budget hearings, we haven't had any committee reports, so I don't anticipate any reports from our committees. Um, there are no appointments for this evening. Um, liquor licenses or bonds, Madam Clerk, are there any? There are no liquor licenses or bonds. There's no resolutions nor um, liquor license. So that brings us to the ordinance. And the ordinance is a public hearing. And Madam Clerk, if you would read the public hearing for the ordinance on dogs. OK. The public hearing um, is an amendment to ordinance. Chapter 9, Animals and Fowl, Article 2, Dogs, Division 2, di uh, vis Vicious Dogs. And I believe this is uh, an ordinance amendment that's sponsored by Councilman Neely. Thank you, Madam Clerk. This is a public hearing on the dog ordinance. Again, three minutes will be allowed for public comments regarding this ordinance as per the, eman the emergency manager's um, instructions. And at this time, I would ask if there's anyone to address the city council on this public hearing. Yeah, my name is Councilman Mays. I'm a member of the legislative committee that creates these laws and ordinances, and this ordinance should come through the legislative committee, which ain't met. I see other committees have met, and I'm appalled that we at this point, and this thing ain't came through the legislative committee. I know of every um, order that the emergency manager has issued. I don't know what Councilman Neely and the emergency manager is arguing about. I don't know why Josh can have meetings, but the legislative committee can't. And I want somebody to tell me why the legislative committee ain't met in about two months. Not only did we have this vicious dog ordinance, but we also had a, um, a, a, a dispensary ordinance, all legislative law. Even the emergency manager sent me the law dealing with um, water rates and shutoff notices when I was trying to get that water back on for them Glen Acres apartments. And I'm a member of the legislative committee, and I know that you named Neely the chair. So I don't know who doing what, who campaigning for what, what the politics is. But when I've got to sit at a council 
and I got to put, we put a motion on the floor, properly second, and then a dictator's type president won't vote on it. Now we're going through another perfunctory hearing on a vicious dog ordinance. As a member of the legislative committee, that should have came through our committee before it got here. And Scott, I'm not going to let you keep blaming it on the emergency manager because you and Josh meet when you want to. I don't know, maybe Neely can speak for himself. Why we ain't had a legislative committee meeting before that got here? Now, I know Neely wanted on a fast track because he wanted to um, say we did an ordinance. I'm a legislator. I'm running for state rep. We need to do stuff decent and in order. I'm tired of all of this politics. That ordinance should have came through our committee before it got to this flow. Thank you, Councilman Mays. Hey, just a point of information. Didn't this go through the committee process? Yes. Yes, it yeah. did go through the committee yes. process. No. We're gonna if I have to take that seat, point of information, I'm on that committee, Josh. I know where it went. It went to the legal department. It was supposed to come back to the legislative committee. You run your committee, and I'll run mine. It was voted out of committee. Is there anyone else that would like to address the City Council on this public hearing? Hey, Mr. President, I'm Mr. Ariel Mitchell. I'm at 3512 Milton Street. About this mad dog concept. Which, to you, Mr. President, which, which what dog you talk about? The, the four-legged dog or the two-legged the two dog? If you ain't no answer to that, I'll go farther than that. Because the neighbors in this fifth ward they got a thing about these, uh, this racial stuff, whatever racial mean, but whoever brought that brick back to the bricks, put it in grand blank, it's going to be on when, it, you know, when the fight start out. But, but like uh, I noticed I'll be hanging out in the fifth ward and this, these Muslims, like, like what that lady said, come on, get ready for a war, that, Mo that Muhammad, like the lady named me her god brother, but she gets some Muslim guys over there, but every time they want to, they say, Miss Lady, could we ask you a biblical question? But I know that she put God, but she always want to put God out of the house when, when them Muslims go and ask them biblical, go and say, look, Mitchell, you guys been over here, give me some quiet time. Put me out of the house, I'll go back for two days and come back in a month and uh, talk about discrimination, drunken brown people's Mexican is all that junk. Yeah, welcome to the United States. All right. Drunken and, and, and all this junk. Talking all that drunken up. Stupid drunken junk. And then them state dudes talking about all oh, that. that all right. Get on. Thank you, all right. <clears throat> Our next public speaker. Good evening, council. My name is Paul Herring. I reside at 525 Mason Street, and I speak against this ordinance. And I, I don't know that I understand it completely, but what I'm hearing is that it criminalizes the ownership of a dog. We already have enough things that they can put us in jail for. Now you want to put me in jail because my dog jumped the fence and bit somebody. Not only do you want to put me in jail, but you want to give me a criminal record. So now when I go to apply at Walmart, I can't get a job. I think this ordinance is bad. It holds you responsible even if you're not. Say I go over to Mr. Neely's house and poke his dog through the fence and let the dog out and he bites me. Mr. Neely's held accountable for that. He's going to get the misdemeanor. He's going to get the fine. He's going to go to jail. I could logistically stifle his whole campaign if I come to his house every 89 days and poke his dog. We don't need to give the police any more ammunition. They're pulling us over left and right as it is. They're gaining fines off the city of Flint. I don't even know if the state police fines go to the city of Flint. But every Friday and Saturday night, I see them uh, with cars pulled over in a row. We don't need to give them any more ammunition. I don't think this ordinance is... is, is is pliable. I don't think it's viable. I think the ordinance that we have on the books need to be enforced. If we're not enforcing the one we got now, why are we going to enforce this one? What's going to be different? If there's no money in the budget,
to enforce the one that's on the books now and has been on the books, what are we going to do with this one? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> James Moore from 4709 Wisdom Street for the third time tonight. Most of the time I agree with the young man that just came up here and spoke, but I had family members that got bit by a dog. They went to court, they won the case, they did everything right. The people said they didn't have any money, they moved to another rental place, and I got three nieces that got bit by a Rockwiler. I don't think that's fair. At some point in time, we need some accountability. We need some STOP, it needs to stop. If you, can't, you. If you can't afford the dog, you shouldn't have the dog. Thank you. Is there anyone else? <clears throat> My name is Barbara Biggs, and this is to Councilman Nelly. Councilman, I love you, and so this is no, no disrespect. But that ordinance between you and the city attorney, we're out here listening to you, and you guys told conflicting stories about what the ordinance. So I don't understand. You know, he said that if a dog bites someone, and um, they come in your house, and even if you're 100 years old, you were here, and you go to jail. Well, Councilman, I'm almost 100, okay? And I'm raising my granddaughter singly. I have a dog. And if, my, if someone come in my house and the dog doesn't bite, I'm going to put them to sleep myself. Because you're saying that we don't have police officers. We shouldn't have guns. I have a granddaughter. So what am I to do? I don't think that that's fair of um, the way that it's written. I'm not sure you haven't educated us, the public, as to your beliefs, but the attorney, and it's not because he's the attorney that I believe him over you. It's not that, it's that you didn't rebuttal, you didn't explain it to us. So, you know, I have to go on what I heard, and like I said before, we don't have police officers, we need protection, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Quincy Murphy and um, I have two dogs. Brian, you done came to my house before and saw them. Um, they not my dog by choice, but uh, my neighbor got into a financial stress where um, the utilities and water got turned off, but he owned his home. And he have two dogs that he didn't want to put down or take to the dog pound. So I um, adopted his animals until he got back on his feet to get moved back in his house. So I don't want to be responsible for um, if the dog get out. And I, I mean, I ain't saying I want to take the response and be um, cautious as far as making sure that he's secure. But they not my dogs. And then you may come to my house and think that they my dogs, but they really not my dogs. I'm just taking care of my neighbor's dog, and I've been doing it for a while, and he in the process of moving back, and this, he been gone for like eight months. So I just don't want to be responsible for um, taking care, being responsible for somebody's dog that I'm adopted. But I do work with an organization called PAW, and what they do is they come out and help low-income residents that cannot afford to feed their dogs. Um, they give them their shots. They make sure they well take, taken care of. So I'm against this right now because of simple fact I um, sit on the other side to where I do take care of um, two dogs that's not mine, but I don't want to be responsible. But if I think I'm going to be responsible for the dogs, then I'm going to have to um, do a plan B and that may be taking them to the dog pound or something because I can't afford or I don't want no kind of records on me because I'm taking care of somebody else's dog. I really don't want the dogs at my house, but being the neighbor that I am, I'm going to look out for my neighbor because the Bible says, love thy neighbor as I love thyself. And I love my neighbor, and if he needs some help with me taking care of his dogs, I'm going to do my best, but I'm not going to do it on the grounds of me getting charge some type of penalty because the dog that ain't mine got loose. Thank you. <laughs> 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 
dog, Squinty. All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Dane Walling, 806 Kensington. Um, I, I thought the discussion was actually cut short in the legislative committee. There, there were a lot of technical discussions about the law, but not much about the substance. Um, I figured since it was public hearing, I'd take the chance to, to weigh in uh, since I've been listening to everybody else for three and a half hours. Um, the better solution to um, 